And Sydney's coming to us from Germany, where he currently lives. Maybe just talk about that for a little bit. Sure, I'll give you the, the thumbnail of my biography. I, like many American musicians, I crawled out of the American garage as a, an electric guitar player, you know, with Hendrix and so on, and uh, was pretty good. And then my high school music teacher thought I should go to San Diego because that was a good place for new music, UCSD. So I thought, okay, new music. Ravel, Stravinsky, and the first concert I saw was with Zanakis, uh, Paulina Alves was my first teacher, and it was like very, very heavy. And, uh, and so I was a little bit intimidated, and so I just started to study philosophy. But the people around, <laughs> which I did, in fact, um, but the, the music faculty said, what are you doing? Why are you not with us? You know? And so I did both, um, and I started writing pieces. And um, because I was an electric guitar player, I didn't really learn to read until I was about 17, which is pretty late for a professional composer. And um, so it was very challenging at the beginning. Um, but I started writing pieces and they had a certain resonance. And so uh, for grad school, I applied to Yale, which was like, you know, I'll shoot an arrow in the air and see where it lands. And they took me, you know. So, so I went to Yale and studied with Martin Bresnik and um, Jacob Duckman. I was his assistant. And then uh, I shot another in the air, arrow in the air after, um, after Yale. And I applied to, for a fellowship to study with Ligeti in Hamburg. And that worked too. You're, you've always been a little bit omnivorous, right? <laughs> and I think that's, that's a thing that we can sense in your music in general and in this piece. And, and I'm kind of wondering, like, were you thinking in writing this um, with electric guitar, I mean, are you thinking about your rocking past, you know? Or is that part of it? Um, I don't think you'll hear much of that, but the truth is, um, because I'm writing for San Francisco and because, uh, I, as I said, I grew up in California, in Southern California, LA, you know, most, most people in San Francisco don't like us much, but we like them. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, but um, uh, I included the, the electric guitar for two reasons. One, because David Tannenbaum is maybe one of the greatest guitar players in the world and someone who I've known for a long time. And secondly, also, there is an autobiographical uh, component in this. I felt I'm writing for San Francisco. I'm writing for a piece that was initiated by a very close friend of mine, Greg Stern, who will be here tonight or is somewhere. Um, and, um, and so there were, there's a lot of resonances, personal resonances, that I thought I should include. I had the chance to correspond with um, the ensemble, and they said, you know, we have a lot of pieces with flute and clarinet and string trio and piano, the Piero. Uh, and they thought, you know, it would be really nice if we did something different, you know, and they said, we have this tuba player who doesn't get much work, and we have a harpist who doesn't get much work. And I thought, well, damn, you know, they're, they're good players too, you know, so let's, let's see what we can do with the tuba, you know, and I, and I just really like the tuba anyway. Um, and I thought about the, the, yeah, the bass, I just thought about the, you know, my, my daughter loves the song, it's all about the bass, about the bass, no trouble, <laughs> you know, and uh, I just thought, you know, maybe I should just, focus on that and try and find uh, solutions for that sound. And I just, I, don't, I always find challenges interesting. You know, freedom to me doesn't ex exist in a vacuum. It's always a, in a question of, you know, uh, like a, a mesh between responsibility and your own ability to move. And so I thought, give me some restraints and I'll see what I can do with that. And, I, and it, was, it was attractive to me, because this is an ensemble that I don't think there's other literature for. And that I'm, that I'm aware of. Yeah, I don't, I don't know really any other piece in the repertoire that's written for this specific instrumentation, yeah. which is really awesome. Yeah. Every player has prominent solistic things to do all the time, and some of them have, at the same time, accompaniment and, um, like the percussionist, his left hand is playing solo and the right hand is playing accompaniment. And, um, uh, and that was a really interesting challenge, to try and find within 10 instruments. There, you'll hear later, there, there are several, um, ensemble, sub ensembles in the piece which are working simultaneously. So it's, you have trios, quartets, and then there's a solo violin at the same time. And it, it's, so it's like a prismatic view of, of the, um, of the, uh, the available resources. And, and that was part of it. And then trying to write something challenging and beautiful for all of the instruments, yeah. So you, you mentioned in, um, in some of the, the notes that you sent our way, this concept of musical faces in a way, right? That keep 
kind of coming back throughout the piece. And so the prismatic aspect of shifting those, those instruments is one thing, right? But is that also present then for you in the, in the actual writing itself? Like, what were you thinking about when you actually set about, you know, writing the piece and structuring the piece and how that, that operates? Well, that's a tough question in, in five yeah, minutes. Yeah, right, but, put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, I'll do the best I can. Well, part of it's very personal. Um, the faces, I, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the actual people, but they're actual people. There, there, are, there are things I think about, individuals, people who passed away, or people who were important to me, and all of that flows into what I'm writing about. I, I, I'm always writing about, I mean, I, I don't think I have a choice. I'm always writing about things I've experienced myself. I'm, I'm writing about, autobiographical things. When I got to, 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 to Germany, um, I was a very um, uh, convinced avant-gardist until I went to Darmstadt and I heard a thousand versions of the same piece. The, the freshness that, that I, I sort of ascribed to that school, I, I just noticed was just not as fresh as I thought it was. And, and then my father passed away, and so I started thinking about and I'd had all these famous people look over my shoulders, Takemitsu, Ligeti, Martin Bresner, Jacob Druckmann, Pauline Oliveros, Bernard Vance, all these great, great, great people, and trying to impress them. And I started thinking about, like, who are you trying to impress? And I, I, so I stopped writing for a couple of years, and, and I, I tried to write the music I wanted to hear. And, and that led me to autobiographical solutions for almost everything. And so in this case, coming back to California, where I grew up, um, and I'm here in the room with people who I was, I'm very close friends with, who I haven't seen in a long time. This is, this is very emotional. I might start crying soon. Um, but this piece was really very special to me. It's in four movements, yes. right? And I wonder, you know, how, how much were you thinking about, like, the, you know, in the context of all this autobiographical um, information that, that's behind it, were you thinking also about like the, the very traditional symphonic four movement structure and how that how does that figure into the to the overall thing? Uh, the simple question answer to that question is no. I, w I wasn't thinking about symphonic form or anything, but I was. I mean, the thing about this group is it's very naked because I know I have soloists, so I can trust them. And I knew that we had some really hot players, and I knew that we had fantastic you know leadership in your case, and, and I just knew that I could take some risks. And so this piece is very much on the edge of the transparency you described is intentional. I mean, I, I want people to hear the players and hear that, and so they're, you know, they walk the plank quite a bit, you know, and, um, and, and every one of them has a lot of very challenging things to do and they have to be at their place at the time. They have to be there always. And so it takes a lot of concentration, but what happens then, I hope, is that it's like you break, like it's like breaking through some, something, and then you, and then you get to a different level, you know, and then, and 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 the, the combination I'm just looking for at least is the combination of of individuals working hard in their own part, making something much larger, you know, and and, and then the concert changing up between accompaniment and solo, and all that was part of it, and, and the different movements have to do with um, different. It's really one question looked at from four different perspectives. This question of aporia, this question of um, impenetrability, which is, um, I think all of us writing think about that. I mean, um, uh, you know, what we do is we wrestle with unformed ideas. You know, you're a composer too, and, and so and there's, there's, this, there's this sort of pre-idea, which is sort of this floating thing, we don't know what it is, and the minute we put a form on it, we kill it in a way, right? That's the, the tragedy of composition is that we kill more than we create. So was there a, uh, was there a single kind of germinal idea for you? Was there a kind of like when you first set about writing the piece? I had like for four, for each of the movements I had a, 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 an idea, the, the, the second movement with, with the strings underwater, sort of, you know, the sort of string quartet. The strings all put their, um, their uh, practice mutes on, basically, the metal practice mutes that, that muffle on the bridge. And it just gives the, the instrument this extremely glassy, like you say, almost kind of like underwater sound. Third movement with the with the, the, the bass harp and the sort of grumbling. The 
fourth one with, with uh, the tuba solo. The first movement was was uh, actually the most um, jumbled in a way. Most con I didn't really know what it was until it was finished. Yeah. Um, I sort of sometimes you just gotta dive in. Could you actually just read, not not the way that it's actually written, but just read the text that is actually written for you at the end of the first movement? Sure. Letting oneself be carried beyond the limits of truth, a certain blindness of human intelligence, a certain blindness of human intelligence. And that phrase repeats, a certain blindness of human intelligence that we keep hearing, you know, as a, as a strand that runs through the movement. So what, what Sidney has done is he has created it as an effect to be spoken into the instrument. And now that's what I want you to hear is what ends up happening. Now take one step, be carried. Yeah, it comes from Derrida, right? The philosopher Jacques Derrida is one of my heroes. Although he's not, he, he is a philosopher, but he's really more of a poet and an artist. His, his, his books are, he writes, set, for example, a musical idea of parallel structures is, is very much part of his writing. He writes marginal um, footnotes, which are much more important than the actual text, and so that kind of thing, and, and they go simultaneously. And in this book, he's talking, uh, which is called Aporias, which is about the, um, he talks about what it means really to try and, try and really get behind what it means to go from the, the world we know as, as living beings to the world beyond, which uh, there are lots of concepts about that. There's the, you know, the Christian and the Jewish views, and there's the, the atheist view where there's just nothing. And there, there are a lot of ways of thinking about our mortality. But he's, in a physical, philosophical sense, he's, or in a, yeah, he's trying to figure out what, what that really means, what, and what it means to go beyond the limits of truth. Because truth is what we can experience, and what is beyond that, we don't know. And, and, and he's, he tried to work on ways of getting around that uh, in language. And um, he refers to historical, classical texts from Cicero and others. That's not so important. But to me, what was interesting is, is what I tried to say before about when we're writing pieces, um, that, you know, we have this sort of privilege of experiencing things before they're really ideas. You know, this sort of, we have sort of, you know, in the shower, maybe something comes in your head. Uh, and then you start to wrestle with it, and then it becomes something concrete. Um, and all those things led me to, to, to the musings that became the, the piece, but really the, this, this wrestling with, with um, the undefined and trying to uh, it just help. I mean, again, the piece is not about that, but there the are things that helped me write, the things that, that I was thinking about when writing. And, I th and that's always a question about, you know, how you call the pieces. You know, I, mean, I don't know how you do it, but uh, Ligeti said once, yes, the title is very important, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, he said once, oh, that's a very bad title. You need to read, read, read. I mean, he was right, of course. But, but the, um, the question is, how do you call your kids, right? I mean, it's, it's not easy. And, and, and you don't want to tell too much because you don't want to color the experience of the listener. And the other, on the other hand, you want to tell them something relevant that you know, has some relationship with the piece. So sort of these, these, these specific uh, textures in the piece kind of popped you first, you know, it was yeah, kind of like, yeah. sort of popped into imagination. And it's not always the way I work. Sometimes I work with, with notes, you know, if I start with the notes themselves, but in this case it was more like a texture or like a, like I said, like a pre-idea. I, I tried to figure out what, what it was that was rumbling around in my head and try to decipher that. I mean, composition is also deciphering and, you know, I mean, every decision we make to decide to do something means we exclude much more than we include. And so I was just thinking about um, what do I need? You know, what's, what's necessary and what can I do without? And that, that, in all four of the movements, that's, that was with the process. Uh, there's another, there's a really cool passage that I want to single out from the last movement. 
Um, actually, it's, it's the same passage, but it starts off in one particular you know, section and then leads into a duet for the both of them. Um, but the uh, Crotale solo that you've written, which you know, so much of the piece spends time with those very delicate sounds and in the contrast between them. And then all of a sudden in the last movement, you get this peal of bells of, of a Crotale you know, kind of lick that, that Stan has to play. I'm wondering if you can just grace us with that. Quite a bit of coordination, of course, and, but this is, it's really remarkable because crotale is so often used for just like one single little droplet or one effect or something like that, but to actually take the full range of them and turn it into, you know, what, what kind of reads as a big like glockenspiel solo or something. It, well, there's a, there's, there is a, I mean, I, I didn't tell you this, but we haven't had a chance to talk about that because we've been, we've been rehearsing it under dynamic just to save the health of our musicians, you know, because it's pretty loud. But, um, there's an inscription on a medieval um, bell, church bell in, in München Gladbach, which is a town in Western Germany. And it, the inscription is Pelere Noxia Mundi, which is drive the evil from the world by peeling the bell. Pe pe Pelere, peel with peels of the bell to drive the evil from the world. And that's really what that is. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. And so I, back to the, you know, the, the, I, this instrumentation, you know, I, I, I think that one of the neatest things about the piece, and you'll hear this very readily, is that Sid has written it in such a way that at certain times, the way the instruments interact, you're not actually sure which instrument it is. You know, it's like the harp is right next to the guitar. And oftentimes the guitar is playing things that sound very harp-like, and often the times the harp is playing things that sound very guitar-like. And so... And so they really kind of mesh into kind of meta instruments <laughs> yeah. in a way. And I wonder how much of that was part of your thinking just overall. That's really, 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 it's very astute, uh, not surprisingly, but also really very accurate. Um, I'm always trying to create sort of what I call hybrid instruments. Like, like I'll say, in orchestra pieces, I'll take like an alto flute and a trombone with a, with a harmon mute and double it with like harp harmonics. And that, that's, that's one instrumental strain, so to speak. And in this concept of this piece I wrote tonight, um, it's, um, there, there's 10 players, but there, there are often two or three different trios going at the same time, then maybe a soloist on top of that. So there's, there, are, there are all sorts of um, chameleon-like changes of, of function. And there's other things that are also, you know, kind of effectual writing for the tuba, and this you don't even need to look at your music for, but just a little bit of the, the actual, what Sydney's calling contoured noise that, that goes through the instrument. which sounds kind of oddly similar to what Stan has elsewhere in the piece, which is the sandpaper. For me, the piece is also very much about rhythm. Yeah. And I want to hear you talk about that and what, what you were thinking in the rhythmic writing for this piece. It's gosh darn difficult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm trying to be careful with my language. But um, uh, the thing is, is uh, one of the things that has been important to me in my life is, is um, my study of medieval music. And in medieval music, you could divide any, any attack into two or three. Yeah. But they only had two or three. There was no sevens, no fives, so just dual and uh, treble uh, subdivisions. But within that, you can do so much. I mean, the, the, the thing about rhythm is, is that you're really defining not what's played, but you're defining the time between events. Mm -hmm. And, and um, with tempo and meter and uh, the rhythmic structure, you can, you can do almost anything with two and three. What is it like to experience music in different times at the same time? And you can only do that if you reduce enough so you can really feel 
the pulses. And so my music is really all about two and three and changing gears. For example, if you have like say a four four in a certain tempo and then you decide to change to nine sixteen, so you have so you have a pretty simple metric modulation, but you get a totally different rhythmic and metric view. And that's that's really all it is. Yeah, and that happens numerous times, what you just sang in the piece. <laughs> but of course, like, we're, we're counting madly the whole time. I mean, like, frantically to, to fit all these rhythms in. And maybe there, there are some things that, that flow into that that are non-musical, for example, the whole question, like, for example, the, the Buddhist question of impermanence, like, where is now, you know, for example, where is the one? You know, the one's either the past or the future, but where's the one? You know, there's already gone, it's the past, yeah. right? And, 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 and those questions of, of how to sort of get to the present, you know, are, are questions that are relevant not only in music, but also in, in life, you know, trying to be where you are, you know? And um, those things fly into my head too when I'm writing. Yeah.